Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to another interesting session in this webinar series by the leading IEEE electron device luminaries, which is jointly organized by the IEEE Electron Device Society, Delhi Chapter, and the Dean Dhyalupadhyay College under the aegis of Department of Biotechnology Star College Program and the National Academy of Sciences, India, Delhi Chapter. The National Academy of Sciences, India is the oldest science academy of India. Today we have with us uh, Professor H.S. Philip Wong, Department of Electrical Engineering and at Stanford System X Alliance, Stanford University. And he'll be talking to us today on a very interesting topic, the future of transistor integration. And he's a well-known figure in EDS and is also the Willard R. and Ines Carball Professor in the School of Engineering. He joined Stanford University as a Professor of Electrical Engineering in September 2004. From 1988 to 2004, he was with the IBM E.T. Watson Research Center, where he did many of the early research works that have led to the product technologies. From 2018 to 20, he was on leave from Stanford and was the vice president of corporate research at TSMC, the largest semiconductor foundry in the world. And since 2020, he remains the chief scientist at TSMC in a consulting and advisory role. His research aims to translate discoveries in science into practical technologies, and his work have contributed to the advancement in nanoscale science and technology, semiconductor technology, solid state devices, and the list goes on and on and on. Apart from that, he has served as the editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Nanotechnology in 2005 to 6, a subcommittee chair of the ISSCC during 2003 to 4, General Chair of IEDM in 2007 and Chair of the IEEE Executive Committee of the Symposium of VLSI Technology and Circuits in 2014 to 2022. He's a Fellow of the IEEE and received the IEEE Electron Device Society KJ Edwards Award, the Society's highest honor to recognize outstanding technical contribution to the field of electron devices that have made a lasting impact. He also received the IEEE NDUS Grove Award the IEEE Technical Field Award to honor individuals for outstanding contributions to solid state devices and technology. With these words, I now invite Professor Wong to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Susanna, for introdu uh, introducing me and then also inviting me to give this talk. It's really a Pleasure and an honor to speak in front of you on this very important topic uh, of the 75th anniversary of the invention of the transistor. So today my talk is focused on the future of the uh, transistor. And I think the future, I mean, I believe that at the end, the future is in transistor integration in addition to the transistor itself. And I hope that by the end of this talk, I will be able to convince you that uh, transistor integration is the technology direction going forward for our community and uh, a lot of the research work going forward will be for focused on the transistor integration so let me just start with a historical uh, background in the past 50 years we have the semiconductor industry has been more or less like walking inside a tunnel um, the path in front of us has been extremely clear that transistor miniaturization is the, is the way going, uh, uh, going forward. Since the 60s and se since the 70s, when Bob Denard uh, proposed the, uh, the device skating rule, uh, the industry has been and the whole research community has been focused on two-dimensional miniaturization as the path going forward to advance the semiconductor, semiconductor technology. Now we are approaching the end of this tunnel and uh, we, as we all know, two dimensional miniaturization does have its limits in terms of physical sizes and also many of the physical effects that appears at the, nan in the nanometer scale or the atomic scale. We are approaching the end of the tunnel in the sense that we are approaching the end of this one single method of advancing semiconductor technology, namely two-dimensional miniaturization. However, there's nothing to be feared because at the end of the tunnel, 
there are many other possible possible paths going forward that we could adopt to advance, to continue to advance the technology. And the future of semiconductor is bright and varied because the demand for semiconductor technology is going to be extremely high going forward. As we all know by now, semiconductor technology is a foundational technology for many of the advanced technology that we desire in society. And the demand for advanced technology and semiconductor technology in, jet in particular will only accelerate going forward. Towards the end of this tunnel, there are many paths going forward. And in this talk, I would like to describe the many paths going forward. And this is an exciting time for all of us in the semiconductor, in the semiconductor community to explore and uh, all these paths going forward to advance the technology. So let me just begin. Today, if you look at the system stack going from the bottom of process technology, device technology, to circuit architecture, system, software, all the way to user application, the, all many of the innovation are now being driven from the top, namely driven by the application need. However, there has to be innovation all across the entire system stack to all across the, all the abstraction layers for to realize all those innovative applications that we have uh, in mind. No one abstraction layer can solve all the problems at any particular point in time. Some of the abstraction layers may play a more important role, but over a long period, longer period of time, then all abstraction layers needs to uh, proportionally advance in order to make advance in the whole system. System-driven innovation is here to stay for the first 21st century. Um, as, as I want to emphasize, even if that is the case, all the abstraction layers will play a very important role. And today, I would like to uh, address my, uh, my uh, comments on the bottom part of the system stack, namely the device technology and the associated process technology and the attendant circuit and system architecture that goes along with it. Because we need to have focus on the system app applications, let me focus my remarks on one very important part of the applications, namely data abundant computing. That those include high performance computing, AI, machine learning type applications, and all kinds of computations that happens in parallel. So let us look at some historical data to figure out what we need to do. What are the innovations that we need to call that we need to bring to bear to make advances in those kinds of applications? And this slide I show historical data of peak throughput of GPU graphics processor units, and the peak throughput is plotted against the number of the cores and the x-axis. As you see in this graph, these are historical data. There's a very strong correlation between the peak throughput of the GPU and the number of cores. The slope is almost one in here. As you may recall, the peak throughput consists of three pieces. One, the number of operations per core per cycle, two, the core frequency, and finally, the core count. The number of operations per core per cycle advanced very slowly due to the uh, coming stemming from advances in computing architecture. The core frequency has already just stalled in the past decade or so, and even two, two decades, due to the limitations in heat dissipation. The one that the one number one area that we could uh, improve on is the number of core counts, and that is shown in this in this slide. The peak throughput increases uh, correspondingly with uh, with the number of cores. As it turns out, the Transistor count per CPU per processor core remains rather constant. And so if you plot, again, peak throughput versus number of transistors, you see, again, a very tight correlation between the peak throughput and the number of transistors, a slope of almost equal to one. So the, the conclusion one could draw from this is, if one wants to improve the peak throughput of a computing system or this abundant data computing, we need to increase the number of transistors available in the system. 
So the first lesson is that we need a large number of transistors. All right, beyond transistors, let's look at uh, the what requirements on memory. In today, many of the memory technologies do require transistors, by the way. So here are historical data of various kinds of systems from mobile systems to desktop, laptop, server workstation and supercomputer. On the Y axis is DRAM capacity, memory capacity. On the X axis is the transistor count. As you can see, over eight orders of magnitude, there is a very strong correlation between a well-designed, between the memory capacity required for a well-designed system and the number of transistor count. So the second conclusion one draw from this is that apart from the increase from the transistor count, which gives you a higher, more transistors mean higher throughput, you need correspondingly a balance between logic and memory. In other words, as you increase the transistor count, you need to increase the DRAM, the memory capacity. Next, so we an example of abundant data computing is in machine learning and artificial intelligence or so AI systems. Shown here, the number of model parameters that it has in the past five, six years or so have increased dramatically, dramatically. So going forward, for example, in today in GPT-3, we have hundreds of billions of parameters that needs to be accessed by the computing system. Going forward, the number of parameters required is gonna be increasing. And so the requirements or demand for larger memory capacity is gonna increase and not decrease. Let's look at historical data on the uh, memory capacity available. On the left-hand side show DRAM capacity increasing at about 1.6 times every two years. On the right-hand side show L2 cache SRAM capacity on chip increasing about two times every two years. Now, increasing memory capacity uh, is one thing, whether you could get access to the memory that is uh, in, uh, on, the, on the semiconductor chip is another thing. So one needs to pay attention to the peak, to, to the bandwidth. Shown here is the rate of increase of peak bandwidth for GPU systems. The peak bandwidth relates to the data rate, such as the DDR uh, for, for industry standards, such as DDR2, DDR4, and so on, the bus frequency, and the IO count. The data rates increase rather slowly uh, due to industry standards and also the, uh, the uh, computing architecture. The bus frequency is, al is almost saturated over the course of time because, again, due to uh, limitations in, in heat dissipation. The, the one uh, item that would uh, increase rapidly is the I.O. count, the bus width in bytes. So over the course of years, the bit, much of the bandwidth increase has been due to the increase in the I.O. count, namely how many I.O. pins you have from the memory subsystems to the compute unit. Show here are the, the two data sets of data I showed you earlier plotted in the same plot over time. The blue data points are processor peak throughput, and the green data points are the peak bandwidth. Over the course of time, the, the increase in processor peak throughput has increased at a much faster rate than the increase in the peak bandwidth. So by now we have opened up what we call a bandwidth deficit, namely. The transistor count in the peak throughput has increased much faster than the ability for us to supply data from the main, from the memory subsystem to the compute unit. So today, well, uh, the most important aspects to uh, uh, from architecture and also from a technology point of view is to address this bandwidth deficit. How do we get enough data to the compute unit fast enough? and in, in, in time. All right, so let's talk about the system, uh, the computing chips today. The computing chips today is limited to two-dimensional circuits. Everything exists on two dimensions on the base of silicon technology uh, and then interconnected by multiple layers of wire interconnect. The memory itself exists typically on a separate chip, such as DRAM, and the connections between the memory uh, and the compute unit is through off-chip interconnections 
which tends to incur a lot of latency and also energy in moving the data from memory into the compute chip. But this is does not this situation does not happen to the case, have to be the case. We could imagine an other situation in which computation is immersed in memory in three dimensions. For example, showing it here, uh, we can have multiple layers of logic and memory technology integrated together. There can be multiple layers of computing logic and multiple layers of memory technology integrated in three dimensions with connected with ultra dense vertical directions, uh, vertical interconnections. We have done some analysis on systems like this and come to the conclusion that one could derive more than 100 to 1,000 times of energy today product benefits if one could devise situate systems like this. Now, the, one, the natural question is what kind of device technology that would enable these kinds of computation immersed in memory, which we call next 3D. The, the three stands for three dimensions. The technologies that would enable this the next 3D situation, uh, for example, in the logic side, it would be what we call upper layer transistors. Transistors that exist at the upper layer of the three-dimensional next stack. Some of these transistor technology examples are, for example, high performance, high high on current, high, high current transistors such as carbon energy transistors or very low leakage current oxide semiconductor transistors such as IGZO, ITO, and IWO. Those have very low leakage current and, for example, can be used in a gain cell memory. And also two-dimensional layer materials that provide a medium of trade-off between medium uh, on-stage current and a medium off-stage current. Uh, mostly can be useful for, for example, uh, random access memory access, for example, and it's the RM selector. All these transistors uh, share a very common, uh, uh, several common characteristics. One, they can be made at low temperature so they can exist in the upper layers of the, of the three-dimensional dim chip. Two, they have very low de device profile so that you can integrate many of them in three dimensions without drilling, with a, and thus enabling uh, uh, vertical connections with low aspect ratio and high density. So two aspects are very important. One, low temperature fabrication, two, uh, low device profile so that you can connect multiple layers of them with high S with low aspect ratio in the vertical interconnections. There are many such technologies that uh, I just uh, I just show you three examples, but there are many such technologies that could be used for these next 3D chips. And uh, for example, you can drive different kinds of transistors, such as uh, what I said, I mentioned before, carbon energy transistors, 2D layered materials, oxide semiconductors. Well, you can also integrate other things such as uh, uh, memory technologies, such as resistor switching memory, uh, MRAM, ferroelectric memory, and so on. And because, as I mentioned before, there has to be a balance between logic and memory, and there has to be high bandwidth access between logic and memory together. Finally, you need thermal management to deal with the, the potential heat dissipation from all these device technology. So there, are, there will be many technologies in it, uh, uh, instead of having one technology, namely the silicon technology, going forward. So these many technologies is what I would call domain-specific technology. Domain-specific technology refers to the, to the selection or choice of te device technology that optimize for the best speed and energy efficiency trade-off. Shown here in this uh, little graphic in here on the y-axis, I plot notionally speed and energy efficiency and then a good goodness metric. On the x-axis, I show the range of tasks uh, that one could do. Silicon transistors can perform a wide variety of tasks uh, from low power to high performance computing, but because it, ha it has uh, generally uh, applicable for many, many tasks, the speed and energy efficiency is not, uh, exam ex uh, is not exceptionally good. However, one could then choose particular device technologies such as 
carbon energy which is technology for very high performance or high speed or oxide semiconductor technology that has very low leakage to increase the speed and energy efficiency of those transistors. But because uh, those have very high uh, efficiency for, any, for a particular application, then the range of tasks that you can perform is, uh, is already very, is necessarily needs to be narrowed down. In fact, uh, you can think of quantum computing or qubits technology as being a very high efficiency uh, uh, high speed uh, device technology, but it performs a very narrow, narrow range of tasks. So what I would, what I uh, we 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 will see going forward is not just one device technology or one transistor technology that would do everything as in the previous five decades of transistor technology, but also but rather domain specific device technology, both memory and logic device technology that would have the best speed and energy efficiency trade-off. We already have some proof points in the current technology. For example, memory uh, device, DRAM, SRAM, flash memory, their memory is already domain specific. Uh, DRAM and SRAM and flash all have very specific application domain that they will address. And so therefore those device technology are very domain specific. So let me give you some examples drilling down into some of the domain-specific device technology that one could begin to think about or contemplate. Of course, these are not by no means the only device technology that we should focus on. I'm just giving you some examples of what can, we can think of. This first example is about carbon nanotube technology. It has very superior electrostatic control because this carbon nanotubes only has a diameter of about one nanometer. And uh, this slide showed a, a very high performance transistor uh, of at 50 nanometer gate length transistors with a subthreshold stop of 65 millivolt per decade, showing very good performance coming from the fact that one is able to deposit and a very thin and, and, high, and uh, low leakage now, gate uh, oxide, uh, we're consisting of 0.35 nanometer of aluminum oxide and 2.5 nanometer of heptium oxide. So this shows that even for a new material, new transistor channel material, such as carbon nanotube, one could derive much better uh, uh, transistor characteristics than conventional silicon technology can do. But not only that, carbon nanotube transistors can be fabricated at low temperature and therefore can exist in the upper layers of a three-dimensional uh, uh, chip stack. More recent work uh, shown by, the, uh, uh, by researchers at TSMC show that you can uh, lay down these carbon nanotubes on a, uh, on a very dense fashion in a more uh, predictable fashion and reducing the, the bundling that uh, typically occurs in carbon nanotube to, uh, 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 substrate preparation. So the tremendous advances have, have occurred in this community. Not only that there, are, there have been advances in a single transistor level, but, we, uh, but uh, our colleagues at uh, MIT, a former student, uh, Max Schulacher, professor at MIT now, have been able to show that you can build an entire RISC-V processor with 14,000 carbon energy transistors, both P and N channel, and, uh, and construct a RISC-V processor that are fully functional. So integration of transistor technology into larger, this new transistor uh, material uh, into a, a technology into working systems has already been demonstrated. Not only that, you can do multiple layers of these. You can start with silicon logic on one, the bottom layer, carbon nano two transistors logic in the second layer, RM or resistive switching memory technology in the third layer, and in the top layer, you can have a carbon nanotube logic and sensor in the top layer, because showing this four layer uh, uh, realization of what we call a next nano system. This system, this chip has more than 2 million carbon nanotube transistors and 1 million cells of the RM devices, kind of realizing that cartoon that I showed you earlier. We're not limited to carbon energy transistor, of obviously. There are a lot of work in the community on two-dimensional layer materials transistors, for example, monolayer, monodium disulfide, 
and other uh, two-dimensional layered materials such as uh, tungsten disadenide and molybdenum disadenide. Shown here are two examples, uh, uh, very good transistor characteristics, good substructural slope uh, from various groups from Stanford, from Professor Eric Pop's group, and also Professor Jane Kahn's group at MIT, showing these two transistor uh, channel materials have very good performances. Other uh, transistor materials that addresses the low leakage aspects of it are in oxide semiconductor transistors, in this case, indium tin oxide ITO transistors. On the left hand side, we show 40 nanometer gate length transistors with very reasonable on stage current, but extremely low off stage current of about of less than uh, one femtoamp per micron, but almost three times, at least three times, uh, three orders of magnitude lower than typical silicon transistor can offer. On the right hand side, show work by Professor Wu at Peking University uh, of indium tin oxide, very good transistor performances. At, uh, at very good suppressive slope at 66 millivolt per decade. These oxide transistors can be used in, in, for example, in gain cell memory. Here I show a typical gain cell with two transistor gain cell. The read transistors, uh, the charge is being written by these right transistors into the gate of a read transistor. And the charge, well, the charge is stored in here can modulate the transistor uh, uh, threshold voltage, and therefore you can distinguish ones and zero. The key part is a very low leakage oxide transistor as the right transistor here that prevents uh, the charges that are really being written into the gate of the, of the read transistor from leaking out back through the threshold leakage current. In this case, in, in, for example, in the case of using uh, uh, indium tin oxide ITO transistors, the right transistor, one could derive very long retention time of a few seconds, which is suitable for on-chip uh, memory that is available for computation. It offers high density, fat, high speed, and low power consumption with uh, practically unlimited endurance. As far as memory is concerned, there are many other options from magnetic, from magnetic uh, uh, memory, such as SDT MRAM to phase change memory, random uh, resistive switching and random access memory, RAM, and the gain cell that I mentioned earlier, and also 1T1C, uh, one transistor, one capacitor, ferroelectric memory with this, with this rocket read, and ferroelectric FET, FET with non-destructive read. The key thing is not so much to ask, what is the most uh, useful uh, memory technology for integration with uh, logic, the key question to ask is how do we co-design with the application in mind? Because many, all of these uh, the memory technology have different read, write, retention, endurance characteristics, and that has to be chosen judiciously with the application in mind. One very important aspect of all these memory technology, of many of these memory technologies, are, is that they can be fabricated at low temperature at the upper layers of the of the of the three dimensional chip, and that is that will lead to having high density interconnect between the memory layer and the logic layer. Many of these memory technologies, some of these memory technologies, have matured to a point where you can demonstrate working systems. So let me just show you some examples here. Here's one example of a reconfigurable RM AI uh, hardware chip. Uh, this is a, a core for the micrograph of a uh, 256 by 256 RM compute in memory array on 130 nanometer CMOS. The left right hand side show a cross sectional TEM image. The CMOS transistors uh, exist at the bottom. The RM uh, devices and RM memory is integrated between metal five and metal four in here, shown in this inset in, in this TEM picture. The chip can be put up. Uh, uh, is fully functional, put in the test board and shown in the, in the, uh, in the left-hand side. One could integrate many of these cores together. Here's a chip with 48 of those cores that I mentioned, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, consisted, the whole entire chip consists of three medium RM cells. And with this chip, all these cores can be connected together to allow you to do a variety of vector matrix modification, not only vector matrix, matrix modification, but also many different kinds of uh, reconfigurable AI algorithms. 
and there is by integrating the memory right on top uh, of the logic computational logic you can derive a lot of benefits in terms of energy DNA product one could also look into uh, have, uh, uh, another example is a sapiens chip which uh, is a uh, chip that is with RM uh, integrated in CMOS in the TSMC 40 nanometer RM technology, uh, basically performing a approximate search for a uh, memory augmented neural network that allows you to do one shot learning with a robust inferencing capability that you can uh, have retain high accuracy of inferencing with many, many uh, test uh, uh, cycles. The integration of memory ontologic, one of the key aspects, as I mentioned to you earlier, is to arrive, is to, uh, is to enable a large memory capacity. To enable large memory capacity, there are three basic uh, uh, avenues. One, two-dimensional downscaling in the XY direction, which is what we have been doing for the last 50 years. Two, adding three-dimensional layers, which the 3D NANs uh, uh, community has been doing for the last decade or so in the Z direction, so X, Y, and Z. Finally, storing multiple logical bits per memory cell, which uh, has been the, the case for NAND flash memory. So by combining X, Y, Z, and L, you could have, you could achieve large memory capacity. Now, large memory capacity stand alone will only give you uh, large memory capacity, but the bandwidth may not be uh, may not be too high. So the key thing is to integrate uh, logic with memory. And today there are many technologies that, are, for example, high copper to copper hybrid bond that allow you to integrate and decouple the fabrication of a logic with the fabrication of the memory itself. Shown here on the left hand side, I show a a, a vision of cartoon of a three-dimensional vertically integrated RM, copper and copper hybrid bonded to CMOS logic so that you can have high density interconnects between the memory and the logic itself. Using this bonding technique, it essentially decouples the memory fabrication from the logic fabrication. It is not this type kind of uh, scenario is not limited to uh, uh, 3D NAND or 3D RM, but also could, uh, here's another example of three-dimensionally integrated gain cell memory with CMOS logic. We could have a CMOS logic with a nano sheets and a, a high performance logic at the bottom, and then integrate gain cell memory on top, as I showed you earlier with the indium tin oxide the transistor, which can be fabricated at very low temperatures. And therefore you can add multiple layers to this gain cell memory on top of the computing logic. So to just summarize that our vision really in the field of future is what we call next 3D chip with compute memory integration of various kinds of transistors and memory in a three dimensional stack connected in the vertical direction through ultra dense 3D vertical connectivity. In fact, the same scenario could be extended to many other device technology that could be integrated together in 3D. I mentioned earlier that we need to have domain specific device technology and those domain specific device technology are not limited to memory and logic integration. For example, what we could mem integrate memory, of course, we could also integrate photonics, spintronics, power electronics, nanomechanics, sensor actuators, RF minimally wave, or even quantum computing in in the into the CMOS logic. This is a situation where we, what we call would we'll call uh, CMOS plus X, where X refers to any of the domain specific technology that one could integrate onto the baseline CMOS. It will bring in new applications, new market, and has very broad societal impacts. So the future is really in system integration including an end-to-end -end optimization of design and innovation. We already seen domain-specific architecture at the upper levels of the system stack, such as uh, AI accelerators that are domain-specific in, uh, in the architectural world, and also software and systems that are application domain-specific. Going forward, we will also see domain-specific device technology 
that is that uh, that caters to a very specific application in mind. And the key thing is that we need to be able to integrate all these domain specific specific technology into a holistic system. To integrate that, we need to not only have a a, a three dimensional chip standalone, but also be able to assemble all these chips to be on a complete system with, with each of these 3D chips offering specific functions for the entire system. This is a situation where we call 3D mosaic of next chip. The mosaic stands for monolithic stacked assembled IC. So we will have many kinds of integration. First, integration of the three-dimensional chips in, in, the, in, a, in one chip. Second is integration of many of these next chips into a package system. So we will have several, several dimensions of interconnections between domain-specific technologies. One is the very tight integration in the vertical sense within the chip. The other one is the integration of connections between chips and on the package level. So going back to the initial uh, discussion I had earlier about uh, technology advancement, for the past 50 years, we have been very successful in miniaturizing the transistor into smaller and smaller transistors and therefore packing more and more transistors into the same chip providing the performance needed and also energy efficiency required, and also the functionalities uh, because of the large number of transistors available. And memory, again, also memory technologies also consists of transistors. Now, in this path of 2D miniaturization, we're coming to an end because uh, we are approaching an end because of the physical limitations of individual atoms. But going forward, as I mentioned earlier, in this talk, I hope I convinced you that going forward, there are, will be many paths going forward that will continue to advance the device technology. And these many paths in consist of domain specific device technology and consists of integrating these device technologies together. So the path of research work and development work going forward is in A, developing those domain specific device technology and finding ways to effectively integrate all these de de device technology, de diverse device technology together into a holistic system that is designed end to end with an optimization that has the application in mind. With this, I would like to thank my uh, sponsors. Uh, we're part of the Stanford Systemics Alliance a, a uh, collection alliance of more than 35 member companies from materials to device technology to system applications and user applications. I would like to thank my sponsors from the uh, SRC, Sam Whitaker Research Corporation, the JUMP program, the PRISM Center and the CHIME Center, uh, the, the National Science Foundation, and also the Department of Defense, and also DAPR to the ELI through the SOC program, as well as some of the the memory technology that uh, memory research I've been doing are supported by member companies of the Stanford Non-Volatile Memory Technology Research Initiative and MTRI. I'd like to thank my students who are the inspirations for many of the ideas that I show you earlier in this slide and my former colleagues at uh, TSMC who has been collaborating with us on many of the concepts that I showed you earlier. With that, I'd like to thank the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to give this talk very important for this a very important occasion for the invention of the transistor and the uh, and the electron society devices society and also the IEEE in general thank you and i'm happy to answer questions for you well thank you very much professor wong for taking us through this journey of last 75 years and how important the invention of transistor has been and especially the the last few years where one can see we are moving from 2D to 3D, all kind of new architectures, and that is definitely going to open up new and news for the researchers to take up these particular challenges. Well, with this, I have a few questions which have been shared by the attendees. Uh, let me just share my screen so that everyone can see those questions. I hope my screen is visible to you. 
Yes, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, please go ahead. So, so uh, let me just go uh, uh, step by step. The first question, how can we get P-type and N or N-type uh, CNT? Um, we could do, do this very similar to conventional drug, drug, uh, silicon transistors by doping, by doping the source and drain, to doping the source and drain extension region, either a type or N type, you can get uh, the corresponding uh, CNT transistors. Uh, second question, uh, do we need to redefine Moore's law with next generation uh, 3D technology? Uh, this is a very uh, complex question. Uh, everybody have a different interpretation of what Moore's law is about. Uh, if you would uh, ask, uh, you know, what, uh, I would, instead of going into uh, what Moore's law is about, uh, I would rather focus on the what we have been doing in the past 50 years is two-dimensional miniaturization. So going forward, 2D miniaturization and the 2D miniaturization allows us to uh, get more transistors under the same chip. And so now the question, and as, as I show you earlier in the in the in the presentation, that having more transistors on the chip is terribly important. How do we get more transistors through 3D integration? Because we cannot shrink two dimensions anymore. It's just like when you do uh, well, when you build houses on a, on a uh, on, in a town, if your land is limited, uh, you cannot shrink your house sizes anymore. There, there's a limitation of how small house can be. And to get more houses or more living spaces, you need to go with the third dimension. And that's very simple. So yes, we do need to uh, rethink our method of getting more devices or more transistors or memory technologies or other device technologies on the same chip. And the way to do that is to go in the third dimension. Third question: uh, the performance of as for the performance of CNT uh, transistors depends on the chirality of the CNT. Which chirality of the CNT is better among all suitable chirality of the CNT and why? Very good, very good question. Um, that would, uh, most of the uh, considerations refers to trade off between uh, on current and on state current and off state leakage current. And we have done a lot of an analysis by looking at uh, a, a physically based uh, transistor model and uh, and uh, examining the trade-off between on-state current and off-state leakage current because the band gap uh, would uh, would uh, critically determine uh, both the on-state current and the off-state current. Uh, the depending on your application, uh, for example, uh, then for example, for high performance application. Uh, with a uh, with the ability to adjust the threshold voltage through a, a wide enough range, for example, over uh, three two to three orders of magnitude of, of uh, offset leakage current, then you need a diameter of about an nanometer. And uh, and if you look at the transistor, uh, the chirality of the CNT, and uh, the uh, uh, then the uh, uh, one nanometer uh, uh, diameter will, will have a certain chirality. If you look at the the uh, chirality to band gap or or diameter relationship of the CNT, you have the certain N and M only a so two or three N and M co co combination of the chirality that will give you about one nanometer. Number four, to the integration of different technologies shown in vertical three D integration, what are the possible application challenges that need to be overcome? There are a lot of uh, fabrication challenges that need to be overcome. First of all, we need to develop and, uh, a variety of low temperature fabrication uh, uh, techniques. Some of the uh, uh, fabrication techniques that we rely on for conventional silicon technology, such as iron implantation, such as high temperature anneal, is going to be not very applicable in a 3D integrated uh, uh, chip. So we need new device technology, uh, device fabrication technology that occurs at low temperature. We are we already see a number of them, such as uh, low temperature atomic layer deposition and uh, atomic layer etching, and so on. And we also need to be able to, um, because we are fabricating many many layers now, not not just one layer, but more than one layer. Then there has to be very rapid increase in the fabric in the processing throughput of any individual processing step because we are increasing the complexity of the integration we're increasing the number of steps required so each step 
has to be much more uh, efficient in terms of time. So throughput of fabrication is very important. So going forward, fab, uh, th processing throughput is gonna be an important fabrication challenge. In the past 50 years, we've been focused on two-dimensional linearization. That means we have been focusing on uh, increasing, increasing the resolution of things that we can do. For example, increasing the resolution of patterning. But going forward, uh, we have enough resolution. We only we need to increase on the throughput. All right, uh, number five, what's the property of fabrication of low temperature? What is the property of fabrication of low temperature an important feature? And that's because at the uh, uh, low temperature fabrication is important because the uh, you need to fabricate but not only the transistor technology, but also the wiring technology to go today. The many of the wiring technology, well, not only the metal wires, but also the insulators is uh, cannot uh, withstand the high temperature processes. So therefore, low temperature processes are important, not only for the device technology, but also for the interconnect wiring technologies. And number six, how the new nodes will be defined in the next generation 3D technology. In the past, uh, that's a very good question. How do we define the new nodes? And, and when we think about defining the new nodes, one essential feature of a new nodes is to denote or demarcate or signify advancement of technology. A new node should have an advancement in uh, the benefits that it provides to the, to the system. Benefits in terms of more number of transistors or in terms of energy efficiency or in terms of speed and so on and so forth. So um, about two, three years ago, I got together with many with my colleagues at, at Berkeley and also at MIT and TSMC and analyzed the situation. How would one define new nodes going forward? I think the essential uh, aspect of a new technology that provides additional benefits going forward is the density of devices, the density of logic devices, the density of memory devices, and the density of interconnection between memory and logic. So I think going forward, instead of a feature size, which was the key aspects of two-dimensional linearization, instead of the feature size, we need to look at the device density. That a increasing device density will provide the functionality will provide the energy efficiency and provide the uh, the speed of uh, uh, of the of the system for a new technology node so therefore uh, new nodes or new advancements of device technology will be uh, paced by the the density of devices so number 7 could you comment about the evolution of strain into the FETs particularly in case of 2D, 3D integration, and how it would affect the device performance. Can this be resolved by epilayer engineering? Since contact resistance can be an issue for 2D FETs, does it limit impact integration of those devices? All the questions you mentioned are very important. Strain, contact resistances, and so on, and engineering the strain are very important. So those materials related questions are all part and partial of the development of transistors. So you need the, all these questions are really important uh, to bring these, for example, in this case, you mentioned two-dimensional layer FETs to bring this into a device technology. Number eight, uh, which dielectric materials better between nanthenium oxide and hafnium oxide? Nanthenium oxide is, if nanthenium oxide is better than hafnium oxide, then why most of the researchers are using hafnium oxide? These are the very specific questions that tie into uh, the particular application domain because there's no one thing that is will satisfy all the requirements of an application. So therefore, whether something is better than something else really depends on what are you going to use it for. So it's very difficult to answer this question in a general generic sense that one is uh, absolutely better than the other. It all depends on how you're going to use it. Um, number nine, as devices scale down, the performance of 2D FEP can be affected by quantum confinement effects and the increased influence of service states. How can one optimize these for integration at a larger scale? Yes. Um, 
irrespective of whether it's a two-dimensional FET or one-dimensional CNT or oxide semiconductors or even conventional silicon transistors, they are all affected by quantum confinement effects and also increase influence of surface states because the, uh, the, the surfaces are beginning to dominate over the bulk, but, uh, the bulk uh, materials. So we need to really look into this in a, in a holistic way and, and uh, include all the, in, all the impact into the design and, and of the device. So the new effects such as quantum confinement, surface states, defect states, and also uh, uh, isolated defect states as a surrounding the transistor, the transistor itself, they all come into play in uh, finding an optimal design point. Okay, thank you, Professor Wong. Let me just uh, stop sharing for a while. Let me just see if there is another question. Yeah, I can see that. I think perhaps this is the last one. Maybe we have a quick two minutes and let's take up the last one. I'll just share my screen again. Maybe you can see the last one. Okay. All right. The last question. Okay. Well, great to see uh, my uh, my uh, my friends from Lehigh and the Sherman Fairchild Lab. Thank you very much. And it's really a pleasure to see you there. Um, the question is, uh, okay, um, what would be the limiting case for 3D integration since the layer near the surface may have the slower electron mobility due to low temperature processes would produce more scattering due to lower crystallinity. Second question, how will qubit integration into the 3D integration? Do you have recent research results? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for a shout out from Lehigh and uh, another alumnus in here. And uh, first question, um, the, uh, the 3D taste integration, the, uh, the question refers to the Devices or transistors at the upper layers may have slow, uh, uh, lower electron mobility or hole mobility due to the low temperature process due to poor lower crystallinity. Um, actually, that is that does not need, necessarily need to be the case. Uh, for example, two delay materials can be grown in large, in larger single crystal uh, of two delay materials, and they do have reasonably good electron mo and hole mobility. And also common energy also have very good electron mobility and home mobility, even though they are fabricated, they can be fabricated at low temperature. So the lower electron mobility, uh, low temperature process probably only uh, refers to silicon transistor or silicon, polycrystalline silicon or amorphous silicon. But if you move to other materials that can be fabricated, that can be synthesized at, at uh, and then to maybe transfer to a uh, to a substrate. Then they can break out from this conundrum of uh, uh, poor crystallinity or low crystallinity for for materials in the upper layer and the three dimensional stack. So the the answer the, the short answer to that is that uh, new materials will break out from this uh, uh, conundrum. Second question, how the qubit cell integrated into 3D? Uh, do you have recent research results? Um, no, I do not work on uh, qubits myself, but I know that many of the qubit technologies such as the niobium oxide, superconducting uh, qubits, or even single electron transistors, qubits, and so on, many of them could be, uh, will be eventually be integrated, could be integrated into in, in 3D. But today, of course, they're in 2D. Uh, for ease of fabrication, but they also use a very similar fabrication technology as the conventional semiconductor technology. And uh, in, the, in terms of uh, uh, quantum systems, you would have the qubits at the very low temperature, and then with the CMOS integration uh, control circuitry at a, a slightly higher temperature. So there have been a lot of uh, research work uh, um, onto uh, cryogenic operation of, uh, of uh, transistor technology. And uh, so the, there are a lot of research work out there.
But at this point, I think um, uh, in terms of uh, qubit technology, they're less about 3D integration. They're more about uh, trying to get functionality and you know, trying to get enough qubits uh, fabricated uh, together. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wong, for taking up all possible questions. And uh, on behalf of the IEEE Electron Device Society, Delhi Chapter, as well as the ad hoc committee for the 75th anniversary of transistor invention. I would like to thank you and to all the attendees for being there with us today for attending your particular session. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.